Today, I'm gonna to be filling one of these super cool barrels with nothing but corn. Oh, and we have a little bit of testing along the way. How's it going, chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, this is Still It, and we're doing something kind of, uh, kind of exciting today. I'm filling one of these barrels up with 100% corn distillate. And you're probably asking, isn't that just bourbon? And yes, technically, uh, by the American standards, yes. Uh, a whiskey put into a new oak barrel, this doesn't count because it's stainless, is uh, a bourbon, if it is more than 51% corn. And this will be more than 51% corn, but, but generally speaking, bourbons have other grains in it as well. Uh, rye, wheat are popular, and obviously barley as well. Uh, there are very few 100% corn mash bourbons on the market. So, why am I doing this? Well, for starters, I have this really cool barrel. I want to fill the damn thing, because I want to age it for a long time. But I also want to take things way back to basics in terms of corn. Think of this like a, a fact-finding mission. What can corn do by itself? And, you know, also at the end of it, I'll end up with almost two gallons of whiskey. So there's that. <laughs> Let's talk ingredients. And to be honest, here in New Zealand, I don't really have a choice. I can't just buy brewing or distilling grade corn. It doesn't exist unless I get malted corn and I don't know, that just kind of feels like cheating. So I'm gonna be using kibbled animal feed corn from the feed store, 60 kilos of it to be exact. To be honest, my math had probably about 40 kilos of corn doing the job of filling the barrel, but like I said, I wanted to have a little bit of extra to experiment with. And to be honest, I just kind of wanted to know exactly how hard it was going to be to mash 60 kilos of corn. So I have mashed corn a bunch of times now, and I've always struggled to get a really satisfying, a really high conversion percentage. So today I'm gonna go a little bit overboard with the process. Now, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. Honestly, you could just put a bunch of corn into a dirty great big barrel as a fermenter, put boiling water into it and leave it. That's not what I'm gonna do. And if you do do that, just understand that you're probably gonna get a slightly lower conversion. So first of all, I made sure to double mill the corn and then fill a large pot up to just under halfway with it. Add boiling water and stir like mad. Keep stirring and adding boiling water until the pot is uh, as full as you're comfortable having it. Remember that it's going to be bubbling away and you're gonna need to stir the thing. Fire up the gas and add in a small amount of sacrificial enzymes. These are gonna make sure that it doesn't just turn to straight porridge. It's gonna make the process a whole lot easier. Don't worry, yes, they will be denatured, but we're gonna add more later. Once it reaches a boil, reduce the uh, heat to keep it on a nice gentle rolling boil. Make sure you're stirring it regularly so it doesn't burn to the bottom. That would be bad. Once that's boiled for 45 minutes, add it all into a large fermenter and insulate it really well. We want the temperature to drop as little as possible. Now you're gonna rinse and repeat as many times as needed until all of the corn is cooked and in the fermenter. This is a super thick mash at this point in time. And for me, the temperature had dropped a little bit too much. It got down to about 87 degrees Celsius. Uh, so I topped it up with some boiling water to thin it and warm it back up again. Now I'm not happy with the gelatinization at this point in time, uh, but my enzymes work between 85 degrees Celsius uh, and 98 degrees Celsius with a Goldilocks of about 94. So there's no reason for me to not add the enzymes at this point in time. If yours work at a lower temperature, wait and add them in when your mash gets down to that temperature. But anyway, I added my enzymes in at this point in time, insulated the whole thing up again, and let it sit overnight. The next morning, I came into the shed to find the mash at 80 degrees Celsius and 1.072, which I'm super freaking happy with. I'm really happy with that. The extra work seemed to pay off in terms of gravity points. But the job's not done yet. I needed to cool this back down to 60 degrees Celsius, uh, the temperature that I could add my glucoamylase. Glucoamylase is just going to ensure that uh, things ferment out nice and dry. Trying to take something from uh, 80 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius with that much thermal mass, 
is no joke. I used the only tool I had available, which was a humble heat exchanger in the form of a work chiller. And it took me three hours to get it from 80 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius, at which time I added in the gluco amylase, insulated it back up and let it sit for another four hours. Now it's time to bring that down to pitching temperature. Uh, and once again, I used the work chiller, which took a freaking long time, but it did help. It did bring the temperature down a lot more quickly. And I was aiming for 25 degrees Celsius. Here's where our testing comes in. Let's talk about the side quest for this video real quick. And this is something I've been excited about for a really long time. So I took the 200 liter fermenter and split it into four fermenters in total. Three fermenters with 25 liters in each and the remainder in the big old dirty 200 liter jobby. And the idea was to pitch a different yeast in each of those fermenters, distill them and compare. Because it sounds like fun. <laughs> So, a huge thank you to Angel Yeast who sponsored this video and made this possible. They sponsored the video and they sent me all the yeast I needed to and they also... Honestly, that's all they did. <laughs> they gave me the yeast uh, and they sent me on my merry way to do whatever I like. So, thanks Angel Yeast. Uh, there's a link in the description down below for these yeasts uh, if you guys want to check them out and uh, see if they might work out for you. Check the description. So the large fermenter, which has roughly 125 liters of wash in it, is going to be doing the heavy lifting in terms of filling the barrel. Uh, so I wanted to use a yeast that I have used before and I trust, and that is the AM1 Angel yeast, which is uh, their kind of single malt yeast. The Patreons voted and decided on uh, yeast to put in the other three fermenters, and we ended up with Angel AG2, which is their uh, like American corn and grain fermenting yeast, uh, English ale yeast, and a Belgian ale yeast. Now, I personally would like to uh, wax poetic about this test and the outcomes of it for like 45 minutes. And in fact, I actually did that, but that's not good YouTube for this video. So what I'm gonna do is put a hidden uh, unlisted video in the description down below. You can click on that. And if you wanna hear all of the details of the test and all of my findings from it, Go right ahead. Anyway, on to fermentation. All of the fermenters were insulated well and temperature controlled as best I could with this many to 25 degrees Celsius. The AG2 went all the way down to 0 0.98 specific gravity in only four days. Uh, the Belgian and the AM1 took five days and they fermented down to pretty much exactly the same thing, which was 0 0.99 and the English that guy struggled a little bit. <laughs> Took it seven days and it only got down to an even one, the same density as water. Each time a fermenter or a specific yeast finished fermenting, I removed it, let it cool down for one day and settle. I distilled each of these as one and done runs with two plates so I could kind of, you know, compare apples to apples with a finished product rather than just stripping runs. Once all of the samples were distilled, I force aged them in a sous vide machine at 65 degrees Celsius for 60 hours. I then let them sit for another four days just to kind of chill out before tasting them. Now, like I said, there isn't a video in the description down below with a whole lot more of me ranting about this stuff, but a really quick summary is the AM1 performed pretty much exactly as I expected. It had a soft, approachable, estuary profile, bearing on the side of almost like, um, uh, dehydrated berries and pears and cream mixed together. It's really quite nice uh, and I'm quite familiar with that now. AG2 surprised me. Super freaking clean hearts in terms of uh, esters, but it kicked ass in terms of butterscotch near the end of the run coming off the still. Uh, and after that forced aging, it's starting to develop some really solid cherry flavors, which is pretty awesome. None of the others have that. The Belgian ale surprised me that it fermented out so well, so dry, although it shouldn't because it's designed to ferment high ABVs. It has a very interesting spice note. Uh, cooking spice, baking spice, cinnamon and clove predominantly that carried through wonderfully in the distillation. And it does have an interesting fruitiness as well. It's not uh, like estuary banana. It's like dried bananas, dried pawpaw, dried pineapple mixed together. Uh, and that did carry through the distillate as well. And honestly, the distillate, after going through the forced aging, kind of reminds me of a rye, but without any of the dill, pickle, or bubble gummy kind of notes. 
The English ale yeast has an even softer and an even more fruity ester profile than the AM1, but it did kind of struggle. It didn't ferment out as much as it could have, and it struggled a little bit with some fusel alcohols and tails showing up a little bit earlier than the others, but but the esters that it did kick are delicious. And these come off to me like the, the only descriptor I can use for it because it is just perfect in my mind. It's like opening up a can of uh, generic fruit salad and smelling it. You know, one that's got the fake cherries and pear and peach and all that stuff mixed together. It smells just like that. Of course, this video is sponsored by Angel and all of these yeasts are Angel yeasts, but uh, there is a whole world of yeast profiles out there that is really well established, like I said, in the beer world and the wine world. There's a lot of stuff for us to experiment with, guys. So, back to the main goal of this video, which is, of course, filling this barrel up. But first, a huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you, whoa, oh, stay there, so much, Patreons. Uh, I thoroughly appreciate all of your input, all of your suggestions, all your tips, uh, all your questions that bring interaction, uh, and, of course, the uh, financial uh, support month to month it is hugely appreciated. I can't say thank you enough for that. So thanks. The rest of the large fermenter was dealt to in two stripping runs. And yes, once again, uh, I did press some of the corn out just to reduce the, the thickness of the stuff going into that still. Once that was done, all the low wines went back into the still along with around about 25 liters of leftover wash and the faints from all of the test runs. This time I ran the spirit run with one plate only, the other uh, side glass is still there just to see if anything's going on. I did remove the plate however. I took 100 mils of four shots and discarded those along with 1.8 litres of heads uh, and then got stuck into the hearts. The hearts went wonderfully, I collected straight into a big bucket after I was sure I was in the hearts. Uh, fortunately, I switched back to rolling cuts before I had a wee issue. Uh, the garden hose plumbing on my still kinked up and cut all of the water to the D flag for a little while. It wasn't a huge issue, but I did lose about 600 mils of hearts that just got a little bit too rough. I decided not to keep them as hearts. It wasn't the end of the world, but it was definitely enough of a kick in the pants for me to really start thinking about upgrading the plumbing for the stills. After getting that issue sorted, I went back to rolling cuts just to make sure I could find the exact cut point for the tails uh, and ran the tails out to keep four faints for, I don't know, what, honestly, something else, another day. <laughs> the hearts ended up averaging out at 84% and there's, there's part of me that wishes that I ran the spirit run as a pot still run instead of using that single plate. On the other hand though, I always do that and it's nice to kind of get outside of my comfort zone sometimes and just do something different. I actually <laughs> ended up with too much distillate to easily measure with the stuff that I have. Uh, so instead of trying to do that and proof it all down in one go, I decided to proof down smaller batches and then put those into the barrel. And I have to say, guys, filling a barrel to the tippy top, <clears throat> it's a very fulfilling experience. Uh, if you are a home distiller and you've considered doing this at all, I gotta say, <laughs> just do it. It's awesome. You know, obviously I just put a video out talking about my impressions of the difference between a stave and a barrel. That's another discussion. There's just, I don't know, there's just something satisfying about having spirit sitting in a vessel like this, knowing that it's gonna be aging for a long ass time. If you haven't heard me talk about these barrels yet, these are made by Bad Motivator and there is a website link in the description down below. You can get your own if you want to. The guy's one of us, he's not doing this you know, as a, a, a cash grab. He's one of us, he's from the forums. The barrels are handmade and they are individually uh, identifiable by a unique code on the barrel as well. It's, it's just cool stuff. Uh, he might be currently out of stock because I keep talking about the damn things, but he promises me there's more coming. <laughs> so hit the link in the description down below if you wanna go check that out. This project is gonna help solidify the whole staves versus barrel thing in my mind too, because I saved this. It's exactly the same blend that went into the barrel, and I'm gonna age this with staves. Aim for about two years, see what happens. Who wants to make a prediction? <laughs> Drop it in the comment section. So if you can't tell, I'm feeling pretty happy with myself right now. It's a very nice feeling, and the plan long-term for Stilla is to start building up more things like this, like this, that can age in larger volumes for larger amounts of time. It's gonna open up 
options for blending and for experimentation and all sorts of awesome things. If you haven't tried it yet, uh, I would consider considering it at the very least. The spirit that's in here definitely has a corn influence to it. It has a corn flavor, but it is going to end up uh, kind of like a hybrid between a bourbon and a scotch, I think. Something more like a Glenfiddichy scotch, something mellow, something approachable, something with uh, fruity flavors to it. And I think that is mostly down to the yeast, but the addition of all those faints from all the other tests as well really did add some complexity into the spirit. And I'm very, very interested to see what this barrel does to that spirit over the next two years, perhaps. So if you liked this video, please guys, give it a thumbs up. That helps me out a whole lot. If you wanna see more videos like this popping up in your feed, hit the subscribe button down below and ring the notification bell. And I'll catch you next time, guys. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.